Right, uh, good morning. Uh, GRA would like to welcome the member for Epsom and the head of the New Zealand Act Party, David Seymour, and, right. and uh, his uh, housing spokesperson, Brooke Van Velden. Uh, thank you, David and Brooke, for joining me to discuss Labor's housing policy and changes with our GRA clients. Um, as, as, yeah, as background, uh, many of our clients are investors and are very concerned about this government's apparent disdain for the role of property investors. In fact, many of our clients feel this government don't want investors in the market. And the most recent round of changes appear to us to be focused almost directly on middle New Zealand. Um, and our client base, young professionals, tradies, uh, firemen, uh, police, these seem to be the average investors in New Zealand, not rich oligarchs. Uh, the Kiwi dream has always been to buy a rental property uh, to privately fund Kiwi superannuation. And NBIE NBI tell us that about 120,000 Kiwis do this at present in New Zealand. Um, here's some stats for you. I'm sure you're aware of them. Uh, out, of, out of the total housing stock of circa uh, 1.77 million houses, 29% of the households went from investors. Uh, New Zealand has around 527,000 investment properties. Kayanga Aura owned 87,000 of these. So 440,000 rentals owned by 120,000 investors. 80% um, of these investors, they tell us, own one rental property. Uh, the so-called mum and dad investors, 16% of the investors own two to four investment properties. So 96% of the uh, rental investment market owns four or less investment properties. So these aren't oligarchs, yet they seem to be vilified in the media. We've seen since 2017, the foreign buyer ban, uh, lost ring fencing rules come in, healthy homes legislation, uh, absolutely draconian tenancy laws, the extension of the bright line and capital gains tax uh, and stealth rules from two to five to 10 years. Uh, the change of a definition of home, a subtle change recently that will see capital gains being levied on many family homes. Um, LVRs pushed to 60%, just an extraordinary lineup. And uh, most recently and most controversially, the removal of interest deductions for investors. So yeah, that's, that's the arena. <laughs> Thank you for coming to discuss it with me. Over to you, David, for your lead in. Oh, look, well, first of all, thank you very much, Matt. And it's always good to talk to a professional who's got his hands on the tools um, and actually deals with people who are involved in the business doing practical things every day. Uh, we don't get a lot of that with our government down here in Wellington, so really refreshing. Um, one of those numbers you, you called up really jumped at me. Uh, you know, was it 560,000 investors? 527,000. There you go. Versus 87,000 uh, owned by Kaiona Aura or Housing New Zealand, as it used to be known. Um, so for every state house the government rents out, uh, private investors rent out six. So yes. that gives you an idea of how minuscule the government's contribution is to rental housing and what a, an incredible service private investors actually provide. And I think we should actually start from that basis. And people who are landlords are providing a service. They're saying, look, you know, your ownership, your cost of capital, uh, your rates, uh, your maintenance, you know, we just do all that and we deliver housing as a service. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a pretty cool thing to do for someone. And unfortunately, um, t landlords, property investors, uh, seem to be in danger of getting classified like some sort of terrorist organisation. Right. Like uh, and I just think those values are all wrong. So we're really grateful to be here having this conversation uh, about what X sees as the issues in housing and how we would uh, govern differently uh, from the current one. Very good. Uh, interesting you, you talk about the role of the landlord. I think that this government is focusing on new supply as the be all and end all of, of supply. Actually, another thing that they need to introduce into their vernacular is the servicing of the existing rental stock. Uh, because, you know, I think one of the biggest roles we provide is actually when the tenant turns, revitalizing the housing stock. 
And uh, with the non-deduction of everything for housing these days, that is uh, with loss from fencing and the effect of that, that's a huge, huge impact. But let's start to get some of these questions that I've, I've got here for you. Uh, traditionally, monetary policy has more than adequately managed the housing market uh, by successive governments for the last 40 years. Why do you think this government thinks it's necessary to make so many changes? Um, I, I think that there, there is a problem that has grown up uh, for most of this century. Uh, and the data is really clear on this. So if you look at the poorest households in New Zealand, uh, they spend more and more of their income on housing. And that's fundamentally why we have you know, kids living in cars and garages and poverty and kids getting moved from one school to the next, transients and, and all the rest. Um, so there is a real problem and this government was elected to solve it. And I knew they were going to be elected in 2017 because when I was knocking on doors in the Epsom electorate, uh, people were saying, I'm happy my house is worth two and a half million, now four. Um, but the problem is I've got these three kids and I don't know where they're going to live. So there was a real problem to be solved. Um, but the problem is actually just that there are too many people and not enough houses in New Zealand and not enough investment into the quality of housing stock. Um, and the reason for that is the government has made it almost impossible uh, to develop property uh, at any kind of competitive rate. Uh, I just saw yesterday, uh, the Blenheim Council has created a subcommittee to choose the street names um, on a new subdivision because they think the names being picked being English names were too colonial. I mean, this is the bureaucracy that people face when they try to develop stuff. And then there's funding of infrastructure. So there was a real problem to be solved. Where there's a difference is the ACT Party and Brookout housing spokesperson can talk more about it. Um, we believe in creating the conditions for New Zealanders to develop their property uh, and funding infrastructure properly. So if you develop it, you can actually get places. Um, we don't believe in what this government's done, which is to constantly punish existing owners of property. Uh, they're highly divisive. Uh, they believe that if they punish a group of people, then it will make them look good in the eyes of their supporters. Uh, and it is completely unimaginative. It doesn't involve solving real problems. But you look at what's happened with firearm owners, uh, oil and gas industry, um, people who earn high incomes with a new tax rate. Uh, it, it's part of this government's playbook. They get a group of people doing something uh, successful uh, and then they whack them because they know it's good politics. It's cynical, it's divisive, and the ACT Party says we should be uniting people behind good ideas um, rather than trying to, uh, to divide and conquer the way this government does. So a, a cynic would listen to this and think, oh, there's two guys that uh, look after rich people, um, and they're, they're talking about, uh, they're talking in memes, um, and I know that's not you. Let's talk specifics now. Um, what are you going to do specifically to... Uh, in regards to housing to sort supply and in relation to these tenancy rules and plethora of changes that have come in. Are you, are you going to reverse them? Are you going to sit on them? What are you going to do? Well, we're going to, we're going to reverse what Labor's just done, no question about that, but I'll let Brooke talk about the wider housing uh, supply issue. Well, thanks, David. It really does come back to needing to build more homes, but looking really long term, not looking in kind of cynical three-year blocks where you know, the government can come out and say, oh, we're going to now put light rail for densification down and we're going to put in a new intersection in this area because that's a good vote buyer for us. We need to be having a hard look at how we get the councils uh, to be working together from different regions uh, with access to funding and making sure that there are long-term investment strategies happening, but also that the government knows about those regional plans and is actually allocating money towards that. So we're looking at an inf infrastructure plan that actually has uh, government and council money working together uh, to make sure that the infrastructure is there for regional housing development. Uh, I think that is a real issue that we have at the moment, um, where we have infrastructure plans that just never seem to get off the ground. Um, but we do actually need to see those, those regional areas working together for a long-term plan. And I just come back to the fact that, you know, I agree with David, this is, is hugely cynical what the government is doing. I know last week I was just at a property investor association meeting 
uh, up in Auckland. And I was talking to people uh, like people who might be watching this, you know, people who only have one or two homes. Um, and they pointed out a really basic issue here, which is that if you're trying, like the government is, to target investors so that first home buyers can get a home, uh, you have to open up for more supply because, you know, a, a rental property might have three or four couples living in it. If that first home buyer buys that one house, you've now got to find another three homes uh, for other first home buyers. Uh, so you, you're not only needing to put one more home on the market, you need to put another three on the market. Um, and ultimately, this is just hitting uh, the renters and the first home buyers and does nothing to get more first homes to be there. Yeah. So just a exactly. question on the, on the specifics. So uh, this mortgage interest deductibility policy of the governments is completely wrong. It's wrong because it takes a long, long tradition of income tax being on income and moves it towards being a revenue tax. So it's just bad tax policy at a fundamental level. Um, it's also totally wrong in terms of its consequences. If you got a million dollar place, a half million dollar mortgage, uh, you're paying 33% at the margin um, and you got a 3% mortgage rate. You do the maths, it's basically $5,000. 1% of your mortgage is the cost of yes. removing the mortgage interest deductibility at 3% interest. So 1% of your mortgage, $500,000 mortgage, that's five grand, that's a hundred bucks a week. You're going to put it on your rent and the person that pays it is your tenant. Your tenant is trying to save a deposit, also known as a first home buyer. So you're actually hurting the exact people you tried to help. When the prime minister smilingly says, we're going to tilt the market towards first home buyers, she doesn't even understand the impact that she's having. Uh, so the ACT Party says that's wrong and that's gone. And if the National Party and coalition with us can't get that much, then I don't know if there's any hope for the future of humanity. So that's a bottom line. Second thing is this bright line test. I said in 2015, taxes are like acorns, they grow. If the National Party introduces a two year bright line, it'll be five years, then 10, then 15. Well, I was right about five, I was right about 10, and I tell you, it'll be 15 before another electoral cycle. So the ACT Party says, if you're opposed to a bright line test, uh, then the right thing to do is not introduce a bright line test because the National Party position of saying, oh, well, we think, you know, five years, is, two years is okay, five years is okay, but maybe not 10. Well, actually, if you don't want new taxes, don't introduce them. And I know this because I'm an amateur historian of tax. The income tax was introduced by Dick Seddon's Liberals in 1891 at 5%. Look at it now, 39%. Taxes are like acorns, they grow. GST, 10% in 1986, then 12 and a half, now 15. And I wouldn't bet against it rising again in the future with this lot in power. Mm. Um, petrol tax, up that goes. Every time you introduce a tax, it grows. So the ACT Party's position on the Bright Line test is to get rid of it. Um, either you're enforcing the law as it was, um, or uh, in which case you don't need a Bright Line test, or there's mass tax evasion out there, in which case you do. Um, our view is the bright line test is a cop out either way. Mm -hmm. um, what's more, it puts more costs onto landlords. It prevents people being prepared to rent out their house because they risk getting on the wrong side of the bright line test. It actually reduces rental supply. Again, insane. Everything these guys do has the opposite effect of what they're trying to do. So we've reversed that. The residential tenancy changes that have occurred over the last several years, fundamentally, uh, based on the premise that your tenant owns your property. Well, if your tenant owns your property, you're not going to get into that relationship. You know, people do have other investment opportunities. All these laws are going to do is make sure that people are less willing to be landlords. And critically, they're going to be less willing to give someone with a history a chance. So again, this is a law they introduced, and it's actually going to make it harder for people that really need help to get it. And funnily enough, more of them will show up at Kayanga Aura, which is already a disaster. So we'd reverse those changes too. Um, our view is that we actually need to solve the housing supply problem. There is a real problem, but nothing this government's done to property investors is gonna solve it. In fact, in each case, it's gonna make it worse. Where are you at on the RMA? Well, the Resource Management Act is 30 years old. 
and again, I'm a student of history, um, the Town Planning Act 1926, the Town and Country Planning Act 1953, the Town and Country Planning Act number no. two, 1977, the RMA 1991. Now there's a pattern here, about every 20 years, we redo our town planning laws. The RMA is now 30 years old this year. It's outdated, it's overdue, it needs to be replaced. And the idea that replacing it with three new acts and mandatory decision-making powers for iwi is yeah. somehow gonna help uh, get more property developed in this country is nuts. The Act Party says you've got to replace it, starting from the first principles. And the principles are, this is to protect the enjoyment of property. You know, so the questions in an effect-based system are, who can object and on what basis? Our principle is property owners can object on the basis it harms the enjoyment of their property. That's gonna give you strong environmental protection. If you put crap in the river upstream from me, you're harming the enjoyment of my property. But if you take the objection rights back to actual harm to property, then you remove all this madness where you have to have a committee to decide what your street names are. I mean, if you need a subcommittee of the council to decide what the street names are in a new committee, what hope do we have of the current generation building like the boomers do? I, uh, I, I did a development in Central Otago 10 years ago. Um, Lives to tell the tale. I did. It was, it was uh, a tough time, I've got to say, dealing with that council. But I remember that we wanted to change the roof colour on one of our houses. Uh, and they wanted us to have a resource consent <laughs> to change the roof colour. So we were changing from uh, olive green to a dark steely grey. And so, you know, it was well yeah. within that. Glad the council was was making sure you didn't get carried away. Yeah, so they we compromised and we waited a month and we had a community board meeting and all the community board members came in and that was on the agenda. And they discussed it and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll let this one slip. So, um, and in, in a parallel world, I'm building a pergola at my house here in Auckland at the moment. And it's 35 metres, which is five metres over the, the minimum structure requirement for a consent, so it triggers a resource consent. And I've spent 10 grand uh, on the resource consent so far. And, you know. I think the real question is why you're so desperate to have a pergola, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you know, you start down a track, you have an idea, mm. uh, but th that's the effect of the, the local rules. Um, so <clears throat> you've talked about Brightline tenancy rules, uh, but there's seven on this list. The foreign buyer ban, where are you at on that? Well, I don't have a problem with foreign buyers. Um, look, fundamentally, they can't take it with them. Um, this country's history is a history of foreign investment, right? So Coupe showed up with his little catamaran and a couple of Cooney Cooney picks, um, and we've been importing uh, foreign capital uh, ever since, and it's been a wonderful thing for New Zealand. And people say, oh, well, you know, what about... Um, you know, the people taking over the country and so on. I mean, get real, you know, owning some residential property uh, is not going to change New Zealand's strategic position. Have you polled that? Like, like just, as, just as a polling, um, you know, from, from a voting perspective, have you polled it? And do no. You, do you think New Zealand agrees with that position? Or do you, is... if, you wanted, if you wanted a politician who just uh, goes by what the polls say, you should have talked to the National Party. Okay, fair enough. Well, they're not listening to us either. They, they don't seem to be anywhere on interest on productions, do they? Yeah, well, well I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you, but I, I, we've got some principle. And, you know, if you own property, uh, then unless you are harming the security of New Zealand, uh, mm. then it's, it's your property and you should be able to sell it. Uh, and I just make the point, you look at something like, for instance, um, the, the Lock and Bar station that came up a few years ago. You know, Stevenson's wanted to sell that. They needed capital for investment in the New Zealand economy. Um, the idea that they were going to be prevented, and they were prevented eventually, from selling their private property to raise capital to make this country a wealthier place, um, I think is wrong. Mm, fair enough. Um, Loss ring fencing, uh, have you, do you have a position on that? Again, I mean, in any other sector of the economy, it's, it's much like, actually, uh, the situation with the uh, mortgage interest deductibility they're trying to make these illogical carve outs for residential property to achieve one political goal, but completely screwing up uh, the tax system in the process. So you know, any other area of business, you can carry your losses uh, across into other areas. Yeah. Uh, 
why you'd make a bizarre carve out just for residential property, uh, I don't know. But what I do know is that if you're making a logical law, um, bearing I've sat on the Finance and Expenditure Committee for six years of my life, and I feel like some people get less for murder. Um, you know, what I do know is that when you create laws with that level of complication, um, you, you actually uh, just invite people with smart accountants, not looking at anyone, uh, to find ways around it. So the loss ring, ring fencing uh, is expensive, it's pointless, um, it, it's not going to uh, solve anything. Probably harder to reverse because the Nats have taken a position on it, but we'd certainly make the case that you know, the, the thing about residential property, the problem is the prices have spiked and, and there's problems with property because we've made it too hard to build. We need to solve that problem, not create all these perversions in the tax system. Yeah, okay, well said. So this government does seem to vilify investors in their narrative. Um, why do you think they just don't make the changes? I mean, it's one thing to make the change, but why do they have to label property investors as property speculators yeah. using tax loopholes, for example. Why do you think they do that? Yeah, Brooke, you, might, you, 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 you got the wisdom on this. <laughs> well, it is mainly to be divisive. I mean, you look at what the, the New Zealand public are asking for the government. They're asking them to make some hard decisions on housing, to build more and give people an opportunity to buy. Yeah. But they know that they don't actually have the knowledge and they don't have the skills, sorry, <clears throat> to actually get more homes being built. I mean, their own Kiwi build policy was complete failure. Yeah. Uh, so people are crying out for something. So instead of the government saying, hey, maybe this is our fault and we should actually change some rules and look internally at the government's laws, uh, it's much easier uh, to create an environment where you scapegoat a whole group of people. Um, and that's essentially what the government has done here is said, well, if you're a first home buyer, if you're a renter, the real issue is not us. It's not the fact that we can't build any homes. It's the speculators, it's the landlords and the people who are actually trying to, you know, have a go in New Zealand. Yeah, well, um, certainly I've, I've been surprised because uh, I'm not generally political. I've never rung up, a, rung up a politician before and said, hey, I want to talk to you. I just get on with my business, you know, uh, but I'm sufficiently annoyed by this government final straw interest on deduction um, rules that I'm, I'm triggered and, I, and I'm calling politicians and an enormous amount of my client base is feeling the same and they're feeling vilified, uh, they're offended and I think they're all starting to actually shake off the apathy that you see in New Zealand. They're starting to talk about it and seek change. So you guys might, might be in for a better result even better result in the next election, I think. Um, Tony Alexander uh, is one of my favourite economists, and he's saying that big house price rises are over uh, with the decline of interest rates ending. We're at rock bottom now. And therefore, this is all a non-issue. The market sorted itself out, that you're going to see growth more closely linked to income growth because the last 30, 40 years has actually been driven by declining rates, which is producing yield. Um, and he's also saying that supply is peaking, immigration's crashed, we're, we're, he says we're producing more houses than we need at the moment. Um, do you have any commentary on that? Yeah, so there's, there's quite a lot in that. Um, first of all, I, I really enjoy Tony's columns too. And what I like about Tony is that he sends out a survey and he actually brings some original information. Yeah. I mean, how many people write columns in the newspaper based on no new information, they just interviewed their typewriter? Um, so I really like Tony for that reason. I think he's a good commentator and he's worth reading. Um, I think he's, he's right that immigration has crashed, but we all know why that is. I think the long-term future of New Zealand is that people are going to want to keep coming here. It's one of the best places in the world. So I wouldn't, you know, and I hope that's not going to be for too long. I mean, I think hopefully by this time next year, we'll be pretty much back to business. Um, let's just see if the vaccines are a COVID killer or not. It looks like they are. So, you know, but, you know watch this space. We, we know that in the long term, immigration will, will continue. Um, you know, it's interesting he's saying that, you know, household formation um, is not as strong as home building. So actually the, the shortfall is being caught up with. Um, I think that, that may be true um, in the short term, but you've got to look at it in the context of 30 years of underbuilding. Um, so, you know, he's saying that we're catching up by 2,000 houses a month. Well, 
uh, possibly, but you know, you look at other other commentators say we're actually half a million houses short nationwide. I don't know who's right, but I oh, I, I, I can tell you I track all the commentators and Tony's the only one that gets anywhere near right. I mean, yeah. it's it's ludicrous. Some of the commentary last year in COVID, um, Westpac ASB talking about um, house price drops between ten to twenty percent. They went up, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, we know we know that we know that commentators are hit and miss, but, but just sticking to the, the facts, I mean, I, you know, I, I think we do have a, a problem still that, that our, our home building, our, our infrastructure funding, as Brooke mentioned, um, our resource consenting, as you mentioned, with your problems, trying to change your roof color, um, and also our building inspection regime, uh, they're all broken. It's much harder and more expensive to build a home in New Zealand than it ought to be, uh, and and there are real issues to be fixed there. Um, Do you, you have a view on the uh, building cartels and breaking them up? Well, I mean, I, I'm always very leery of people that want to break up cartels because what they're really saying is this is a country 1,500 kilometres long, 5 million people living amongst a mountain range, and we know how many competitors there should be delivering jib board to, to that population. I mean, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that uh, government should first do no harm and the basic monopoly or virtual monopoly of councils on building inspections means they're very risk averse it's very hard to get new products in and very hard to get competition um, people keep saying that you know there's anti-competitive behavior from Fletcher and all the rest um, you know there's a pretty big incentive to prove that and no one ever has so well, I just well, brands is impossible other clients trying to get through brands with innovative products and yeah. you know the the amount of red tape that comes up is prohibitive, and so it stifles out competition. I'm going to say. Yeah. So so if you look at what ACT proposes in our housing policy, um, as the the third bit that, that Brooklyn might get to, is we say, look, you should have mandatory private insurance on new builds. We don't care how you do it. You get private certification. Architects uh, traditionally used to do certification of things they designed. Um, you know, you could self-insure, um, but, but we don't care how you do it. And if we did that, instead of insisting on council sign-off, when council, I mean, council should have been fired from building inspections after leaky buildings. Uh, why have I still got that job? I have no idea. Um, but, but councils and brands are massively constraining the amount of innovation in the building space. And as a result, we have some of the most expensive per square meter costs in the world. So we, we do need to change that. And X viewers get the councils out, mandatory private insurance, all good. Mm. Okay, interesting. Uh, the media seem to be censoring a lot of commentary from the right uh, as anecdotal, but I've seen it. Um, that Troy Balker article, which was a pretty right wing view of things. Uh, yeah, it was a good article. Yeah, I, I thought it was great. I loved it. Um, and so I was commenting in there and there were 96 comments and it was really starting to take flight, the, com the comments in there, and the Herald took the comments down. Mm. And I see that um, often on the Herald. And I think big picture, the, uh, the media are pretty left and they're holding hands with this government. Do you have any concerns about that? Um, I do. But do, do you feel censured by them? Or, you know, do you feel like they... they I mean, Sort of hard because they can censor you by omission, and I can't make yeah. them. I say, why aren't you? And I say, well, I can't make them. You know, put me on the six o'clock news talking about flat taxes every every night. Yeah, it is their choice. But what I do say to people is, look, um, there are five newsrooms in this country, big newsrooms. So you got TVNZ, RNZ, uh, News Hub, um, Media Works, or uh, sorry, NZME, um, and uh, and Fairfax or stuff. So, you know, you've got quite a lot of competition there. And if one of them thought that they could get bigger audience share by doing more right-wing views, I guarantee they'd do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think if you believe in markets, you believe in private property, you believe in competition and choice, then, you know, you've got to sort of accept that these guys are in a competitive environment and, and they're basically serving their marketplace. Um, that, that's very annoying sometimes. But I'm just always a bit leery of people who say, oh, you, you know, there's a big conspiracy. I'm like, really? Because if, if you believe that five newsrooms are in a cartel, um, then, you know, what, 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 how do you think that happens? It does sound a bit conspiracy theorist. Oh, I think there's a lot of social engineering going on this media systemically through all sorts of stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's an open market, that, that particular market. Yeah. I think it comes down to the editors and their education. 
and often their arts-based education put them through sociology departments and that's where it comes from. Oh, hey, I, um, I agree with the sociology departments, but I just, I just think you've got to ask yourself if, why, why is, if there is a big market opportunity for, for more media on the right, you know, it's amazing yeah. that it's taken it up yet. Yes, well, um, do you think that this is politically important to Labour, the housing issue, because there's only 120,000 landlords, so who cares? Just, just line them up on the wall, shoot them all, and do whatever you want. Um, do, do you think it actually, what's, what's the voter impact of this? Because uh, 120,000 landlords, that's 120,000 households, presumably might be 240,000 people if, there's, if they're all married. Um, and I'm sure they're not, but, you know, raw number, 240,000 families. We might have some families uh, in there sort of balance it out, I mean, huh? Yep. And then um, then there's probably kids in there and the kids are looking at their mum and dad saying, oh, mum and dad are getting shot, so I'm not going to get my inheritance. So maybe you add the kids in, it's more like 500,000 people. And these are all swing voters mm. who are being lined up against the wall and having their inheritances shot or their, or their personal retirement savings plan shot. And so I, I looked at there's three and a half million voters in New Zealand at the moment. So 14% of the voters are being shot by this government from what I can see. Do you think that is material to them or they just don't care? Well, what, what I'd say is we've actually got to unite uh, all people who believe in private property rights, who believe in meritocracy, that you should be able to make a difference in your own life and the lives of those you care yeah, about. 100%. Ruled by the government, because here's the thing. Uh, I had a very similar debate with the firearms community two years ago, and they said, well, there's a quarter of a million licensed firearm owners, and they've all got, you know, my spouse, and they've all got a couple of kids, actually. Yeah. It's a million voters. And I said, mate, if there's a million of you, this wouldn't be happening. Um, and then you get property investors say, well, you know, you're 108,000, uh, there's half a million. Actually, um, you need to bring together all people. Oil and gas industry in Taranaki also got lined up against the wall, as you say. Um, you know, everybody who believes in free speech, uh, people who run small businesses who are also under assault um, with these ridiculous labour laws, particularly these so-called fair pay agreements. So we need to unite all New Zealanders who believe in good ideas that we make this place a country where if you work hard, you save up, you invest carefully, uh, then you actually deserve to do well, not be constantly whacked as a whipping boy or girl uh, for a populist government that is divisive and uses divide and conquer tactics. So um, I guess my answer to your question is, is you, you probably alone as property investors, um, a, a small enough group that they can dismiss you. Once you start looking at all the other people who have similar concerns, uh, then you're starting to get to that half a million, a million voters that can turn an election. And that's how we've got to think. Uh, very well said. So <clears throat> I've got one more question for you before we close. It's, it's really uh, it's not a question, it's a statement. Um, and it's, a, it's my view of supply. I'm probably not for that and probably best and I deal with many of the councils around the country. And I just, and I'm sure you've observed this, but I want to point out that on a thousand metre piece of land in Auckland, I can now put seven to 10 to 20 houses, in some cases, 90 houses, if it's terraced housing and apartment building zoning. Uh, but if it's, if it's, you know, mixed housing zones, I can put seven to 10 houses there. And since the unitary plan has started to operate, October 2016, it came in, there has been an explosion of supply. Uh, exactly the same size piece of land in Rotorua, I can put two houses on it. So I don't think New Zealand's got a land problem, I think we've got a zoning problem. And if you remove the density rule out of the RMA, and as said you say you've got to create a livable environment, then you have Auckland. You have an explosion of supply of warm, dry environments that everybody deserves. Um, and I'm, I'm you know, certainly believe that they do deserve it, but um, that's the solution. You take the density rule out of small towns and you consolidate the uh, district plans into something with, that's more cohesive and consistent through the whole country. And you will get guys like me going into Rotorua, where, where I own uh, heap of land and Christchurch, and I'll just start blitzing through terraced housing. And that's when you'll get supply exploding. It's that density rule. And Auckland cracked it with the unitary plan. I think the rest of the country needs to follow suit. And only, only the politicians can drive that. Yeah. Look, tend to agree with you, but can I just add something? 
So, so yep, um, the, the land use planning, the RMA, the district plans that councils impose are, are a shocker. And, the, and yes, the AUP um, has allowed a lot of intensification and I represent the Epsom electorate where, you know, I drive around everywhere I go, I see um, a range of four to six um, townhouses going up and that is gonna seriously drive supply for a segment of the market. Yep. Um, I think, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, just make one comment is that um, ultimately the measure of whether supply and demand are matching is the price. Um, the price is still going up. So that's sort of my measure of why um, maybe the, the, the supply hasn't caught up with the demand yet. Interest um, rates. Well, it's, that's true too. But, um, you know, if you, could, policy. If, you could build, if you could build for less, uh, then you'd see prices coming down. Um, now, but the, the real issue in my view is that the, no matter what legislation, whether it's the RMA or some new legislation um, that you give to councils, uh, you, you know, if they don't see the equation of revenue and infrastructure costs adding up, um, they will find a way to say no. You say, oh, you've got to do it within 20 days. They say, guess what? 20 days just started again. Um, you know, they'll, they'll always find a way to be obstructive if, if it's going to cost them money to say yes. Uh, and that's why X policy, as Brooke mentioned, of having 30 year partnerships between central government that has the money and local government that does the planning um, to fund infrastructure properly, I think is essential. Um, yeah. we and, I, and I 100% agree with you. You've yeah. got to put the infrastructure on the ground. You've got to get the planning right, but you've also got to make it profitable for the councils to say yes. Otherwise, they'll find a way to say no, no matter what planning rules you give them. Here's another. Here's another um, last comment. Um, I've developed houses in Australia and I was in the uh, in Victoria in a little um, county called um, Frankston, Frank Frankston District Council. And Frankton, Frankston District Council, lo and behold, were exactly the same as Auckland District Council at the time, which was non-responsive and unhelpful and quite anti-developer. And I had 10 uh, developments going in Frankston at the time, and I was putting in my um, development authorities, uh, which is resource consent, and they just weren't responding. So I found the most wonderful thing in Australia, which I think we need to copy, and that was the Victoria Land, Victorian Land Administration Court, BCAT. And for $50, I lodged my resource consent with BCAT and within three weeks, I had a referee sit down, look at it, and, and council were commanded to attend the meeting for $50. And they looked at council and said, we've reviewed Mr. Gilligan's application, and we can't see any reason not to award the application. Can you see any reason not to award the application, council? And council said, uh, no. Well, we're awarding it. Bang. You will issue the resource consent, the DA, within three working days or will award interest to Mr. Gilligan, case dismissed. I did that nine times. I started to lodge my development authority application with a VCAT application simultaneously. And it's amazing. So that's how you sort these councils out. You put a statutory um, body above them, like the dispute tribunal, who's properly resourced and you hold them accountable and that sorts it out. Mm. All right. Um, can I say to you, um, firstly, thank you very much for coming and talking to our clients. Uh, breath of fresh air to have somebody that doesn't hate property investors talk to us. Um, how can GRA clients get behind you guys? And, and what do we need to do to get you having some influence that you can bring, uh, bring these policies that we like uh, into government? It's a great petition. I'll let it like <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've currently got a petition to reverse um, the interest deductibility removal. Um, so to allow that what used to be to still continue um, and also to remove the bright line test. Um, so if you haven't already, please go onto the ACT Party uh, website or onto my Facebook page and you'll be able to find the petition there and please do sign it. And one thing that I'll be doing is giving regular updates about what changes are happening when we know more information about what the government is going to do and I'll be keeping people up to date and hopefully with enough pressure uh, we can change the government's uh, plans. Yeah and I think the most important thing is you know like no one trusts me I'm a politician the only people less trusted than us are the journalists who report on us 
Um, so me telling you to give your party vote to ACT, to support ACT, join ACT, give money to ACT, like no one believes that because they're just saying, you know, you're, you're clearly biased. Um, you, on the other hand, are trusted by your mum, your dad, your son, your daughter, your landlord, your tenant, uh, you know, who, whoever, uh, you're actually a trusted advisor. Um, and if you say to people, oh, I've seen David Seymour and Brookman Belden from the ACT party, uh, they're talking sense. Uh, they're actually standing up, not just for property investors, but for the values of New Zealanders who want to make a difference in their own lives and the lives of those they care about. Um, I think that it's worth getting behind them. You saying that is more powerful than anything I can ever say to a voter. Uh, and if you do it, you might find that there's a few more of us very soon. Well, I'd also say that many of my clients are influencers, especially online these days. So I think that's what our clients need to do is to get behind ACT and anybody that's supporting uh, investors to turn these uh, very divisive rules around. So thank you both again, uh, Brooke and uh, David, really appreciate it. And uh, perhaps closer to the election, we'll talk to you again and see what else has come through. Um, or maybe even if these supposed uh, principal interest rules come through from the Reserve Bank, we can have another chat um, or rent, rent controls, two more things that we're seeing in the wind, which... Um, rent controls completely. You know, the Swedish economist Asa Lindbeck said the only more effective way to destroy a city than rent control is bombing. Wow, yeah. I think, I think I'd actually make a lot of money if they do it because they'll wreck the market to a point um, where they'll actually destroy value and there'll be a bunch of bargains to buy. So that's my view of rent controls. Yeah. Thank you both very much. Uh, we'll see you again. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you.